Hi everyone, welcome back to another episode of Around the Water Cooler with any DNR. Today it's me, Devin, and Alexa, hello. Hi. So today we have a group discussion with everyone in our agency that is a division head or a director and or a supervisor. Um, so yeah, we're going to talk about those drought planning and mitigation efforts throughout the state and I think it's important before we start this discussion to kind of go over what is a drought. So the Glossary of Meteorology defines a drought as a period of abnormally dry weather sufficiently prolonged for the lack of water to cause serious hydraulic imbalance in the affected area. Um, And what I think is important to note here is, although that sounds like very dense, drought can be defined by different aspects of what you think it is. So to a farmer, drought is completely different to the um, municipalities in Omaha or Lincoln. So it's kind of defines. It has to, it has a lot to do with what is normal. Um, yeah, that is true. Yeah. So the normal now might not be the normal in 10 years and mm-hmm. it's vastly different than the normal 30 years ago. Right. So dry land that is always dry might not consider it to be in a drought like state or you know, depending on the weather conditions of that year, it might get drier and then that's considered their drought. Or if you're used to a lot of precipitation and you don't receive any, that could be considered a drought for that area. Yeah. Just depends. And um, some of the other people that we will listen to later on in the podcast definitely talk about drought as both a planning process and as you're currently in a drought, what can you do about it? So there's that mitigation, that planning, the department does both. Um, So... We want to plan, not panic. And that's something that Mike said. So I'm quoting Mike there. We want to plan, not panic. But it's good to know that there can be different severities of drought across mm-hmm. the state. And then that means different things for different people. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so we work with the different um, stakeholders. We work with different NRDs. We work with Gaiman Parks. We work with um, the Department of Ag. We work with a lot of different entities to address drought across the state. Uh, And we'll kind of go into a little bit more with each one of our sections that we talk about. um, The differences between those planning efforts and those mitigation efforts. Another thing to maybe think about is when you think of drought, like we were talking about that it affects people differently across the state, is that there are different water supplies and demands that that drought could affect. So some of the water demands and water uses in Nebraska are completely diverse if you look across the state. You know, they can include municipalities, domestic, agricultural uses, in-stream flows for fish and wildlife, and then hydropower too. Right. Um, so, yeah, the water supplies are driven by snowmelt, rainfall runoff, and aquifer base flow contributions, and supplies can be highly variable throughout the state. So some things that water planning does specifically within the Department of Natural Resources is use different tools to address drought and drought planning, like the Palmer Drought Severity Index, which is also used by the Nebraska Drought Mitigation Center, or a recession tool by the USGS that can tell you If it doesn't rain for the next 30 days, what is your water supply going to look like? So there are lots of different ways to view drought, to visualize it, to plan for it, and Mm -hmm. to mitigate it. And we are trying to do all of those different things, incorporating different data sets, talking to different stakeholders, and doing the best we can to address it throughout the state. Because as of December 6th, all of Nebraska is in a drought. Uh, But that drought severity ranges from extreme drought to exceptional drought to moderate drought, just depending on where you look. Um, And that's subject to change, you know, throughout the winter, too, depending on rainfall, snowmelt, whatever. But the Drought Mitigation Center updates this map of Nebraska every Thursday, so it's a good resource to look. So, fun fact, um, it is currently the fourth driest year to date in the past 128 years. Oh my gosh, that's crazy. But isn't that? And like nobody, they, I just, I don't know. I can't even imagine what the first driest drought would look like. It's probably know. in 2012. That was pretty bad. You yeah. know, now that I um, work in DNR, whenever it rains or snows, I'm like, oh, I hate it. But a little voice in the back of my head's like, we need it. We need it. <laughs> <laughs> We're supplying the water to the state. Drink earth. <laughs> 
<laughs> um, but yeah, so on the sadder part of this, it turns out that um, within the drought affected areas in the state, uh, 1,824,569 people are affected by that drought. And that is so many people. And that doesn't say like, it's like almost 1 2 million, million farmers or like mm-hmm. 1 million citizens or 1 million stakeholders. Like everybody is affected by drought in some way. And another fun fact that this October in 2022 was the 16th driest in the last 128 years, which is just strange to like put into retrospect. Like, Cause I don't think of October as like, especially dry or rainy or anything like that. I guess I just don't think about that. And we're breaking records left and right in the state right now. Well, I think something interesting to note here is that in the past 128 years so when you were thinking about how do we plan for drought or how do we plan for any kind of natural disaster you can look at the stat and say like well I'm not going to be alive in 128 years why is that important but this is so important for the livelihood of our natural resources like this Mm -hmm. is this is crazy that this could only get worse or it could get better but it's all about how we manage it and what we do about it yeah and that's what a lot of people think about they think about the short term i'm here right now i just want to use 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 but you know that's why our agency exists is to prolong and protect the life of that natural resource which is water in our state which is a key role in our life economy, our lives. Think back to, I think it was 2012 when we had to like have those water restrictions when you couldn't water your lawn or whatever, you know, it was just, it's crazy because very, very, very easily your life could be drastically impacted by um, drought and people just don't think about it because they think about the short term. They're like, okay, whatever, I'm going to take a three hour shower. (laughs) We hope you don't do that. Please don't. <laughs> That's not necessary. You're cold at that point, I would assume. Yeah, so this um, this agency-wide drought podcast is so timely because of the state of drought that Nebraska is in right now. And not only in Nebraska, but a lot of the western states and the mm-hmm. continental United States are facing drought. Like, this is such a timely piece that we need to better manage our water resources and We just want to showcase what the Department of Natural Resources is doing to help with those efforts. Exactly. And we're working with everybody. We're highly collaborative. Like, we could not do this without everybody's hands in um, the bucket, I guess. I don't know. The water bucket. In the the water pail? In the (laughs) hand in the water cooler? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So, um, thank you so much for... um, clicking on this episode and your interest in learning about drought throughout the state. And I hope you enjoy the discussions to follow. Next up, we're going to be talking with IT and they're going to tell us a little bit about what they do and their part in drought planning and mitigation efforts. So excited. Woo-hoo. And our guests are Kim, Ryan, and Jeff. And we want to talk to them a little bit about who they are and what they do for our agency in our drought planning and mitigation efforts. So, um, Kim, do you want to start first and just introduce yourself, who you are, and maybe what you do? Okay. I am Kim Minky, and I am the IT manager here at DNR. And we have so many different projects every year uh, that we need to do from the different sections that we have. So I mainly try and work with all the sections and figure out what we need to do this year versus next year. I'm Jeff Hogan. I supervise the uh, application development team. Ryan Warner. I am an IT applications uh, developer specializing in GIS and lead a group of GIS professionals that create dashboards and other GIS related products, including drought related applications. (laughs) Okay, awesome. So since we are talking about drought and planning mitigation efforts, and Ryan, I'm just going to pick on you because I said that I would first. Um, Can you tell us a little bit more about your um, experience in the Esri dashboards with drought? Like specifically, what does your team do? Or what products, services do you provide or help provide? Right. So we help a lot of the other divisions in the agency with uh, mapping and GIS-related applications. Um, One of the main applications that we've been working with water planning on is the Lower Platte Drought Monitor. Um, That is an ESRI dashboard application. And... We show a lot of real-time drought-related data. Okay, so um, just a random question. This could be for anybody. So speaking of, like, real-time data, 
How hard is it to get real-time data to show up in any kind of program or application that we have at DNR? Is that difficult? There's quite a process for it, and the IT and GIS staff have to work really closely together in order to get that accomplished, if you, especially if you want to see it over a map, within a map, which actually makes it easier for people to understand. Yeah, I would completely agree. I like maps myself, so. So for a lot of the real-time automated data in the GIS um, dashboards, we usually work together quite a bit with the development team um, and the users to automate tasks so that we see daily information or even hourly information in the application. Uh, we set up a virtual machine that has automated tasks that run you know, up to every 15 minutes to update the data in the applications. Okay, so what about, um, still speaking of data, what about the general public? Like if uh, Farmer Joe wants to look at some kind of data that we provide, how could he go about doing that? Do we have any kind of efforts to make it easy for the public to access our data? We have quite a bit of data that's out there available through just search mechanisms. If they want to search by their last name or a county or a specific area. And also we have that data available through maps. So like if they want to view a map, like if they want to find out the dams in a certain area, they can go into our dam dashboard, dam safety dashboard probably should say, but they can go into that dashboard and they can download uh, pretty much any data that we have on there. There's certain data that we cannot uh, by law have out there to the public. They have to call in and request it. That makes sense. So what's the process of updating that data? Is there... Do you just do it whenever somebody asks, or do you have um, kind of like a set range? Or so how does the, that work? The GIS data is updated automatically. All of the data on Nebraska Map and on our GIS portal is registered with the database. So anytime someone makes an edit uh, in real time, that edit is automatically added to the data. So anybody who hits that URL and refreshes their map or browser, gets up-to-date information. So, so it's dynamic, I guess, dynamic data. So the public would call in and say if they sell their land or something, then that means the dam would change names or the well registration or the surface water right changes names. So then the public calls that in or there's a process for that, for that data that needs to be updated to get to our staff. And so that section who's ever in charge of that data will go into the custom tools that our developer team that Jeff is in charge of, they created all these custom tools for them. They'll go in there and edit it, and then the development team and the GIS team have created workflows so that as soon as that's updated, within 15 minutes, it gets pushed out to the public. Wow, that sounds like a lot of communication, not only between IT, but um, also within the other divisions. Is that difficult? Does that create some challenges of maybe somebody has a different view or perspective of how they want the program to be shown, displayed? How does that? Yeah, we usually check with the division manager anytime there's a public info request to make sure that we should be giving that data out or how that information should be displayed. Or if we put that information out in an interactive map or a map layer, there's usually some sort of disclaimer that we put in the map uh, to let people know, for instance, that public wells aren't shown in the map. So if they think they're getting a copy of all the wells in Nebraska, they're um, actually getting a smaller subdivision of those wells that it doesn't have, or municipal wells uh, in the data set. So I know it kind of went on like a little bit of a tangent, but Jeff, going back to you about the development team, can you give us something that um, you and your team are working on for the drought planning mitigation efforts? Well, Ryan mentioned earlier that little plat drought monitoring dashboard the development team was in, uh, responsible for doing all the back-end stuff, getting the, all the data gathered from all the other various APIs and pulled into the uh, layers that are used by the GIS. And there's all kinds of tasks that run throughout the day to update the information. Do you work with um, like consultant companies too, or is this all just in-house of the development programs, the APIs? Is that all done within the Department of Natural Resources? This is all done with internally. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> So something that I was thinking of that I just kind of thought about. Um, so it sounds like there is a lot of back end work that goes into collecting data, visualizing it, kind of getting that message out. Maybe not specifically about drought, but any kind of products that the Department of Natural Resources wants people to have. Does that mean that everybody that works in your division has a specialty or 
are you looking for people that want to work in IT that have a background in coding or any kind of, like, how does that work? It sounds like there are so many things. How can you tie that all together to make deliverables? I would defer to Jeff, but I think <laughs> what, what IT, the development side anyway, from they coded in a way so that it's universal so that any of the developers could step in and work on any of the different projects. So they have a structure, an organization to their coding so that anybody could work on, come in and pick up and work on the different projects that they do. Jeff, chime in. Yeah, within the development side, yeah, everything is standardized. So once you know the standard, you can work on any part of it. We don't have any developer that's specifically designated to a certain area. Well, that sounds cool. It sounds like every developer probably has a broad range of skill sets then. They do, and they get to work with GIS a little bit, too. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Is that the same for your team, Ryan? Does everybody kind of help with um, the different aspects of different projects, or is there certain people that have kind of like their niche? Yeah, everybody's pretty well-rounded. Uh, some people like, you know, more specific things. Some people like to get into Python and programming a little bit more, and some people like to stick with the, you know, like Esri software side of things. But we try to give everybody a little bit of what they like to do and be creative with it and see what they can come up with. Awesome. And then we have Jeff review it and make a bunch of changes to it. <laughs> <laughs> give the big thumbs up or thumbs down. <laughs> Okay, Um, I don't have any other questions, but I'd like to leave this as, do you have any kind of parting last minute thoughts of anything that you want to get out to the public, maybe about IT specifically or anything about um, the work that we do here at the Department of Natural Resources or any kind of tips or tricks or anything? Maybe like brush your teeth every day. Well, DNR is wanting to get their data out or our data out to the public. And Jeff's development team has created these APIs where the public can come in and consume the data in an easier format in real time. So if there's data that we don't have out there that you guys would like, the public would like to see, they can put in a public information request and maybe we can help them out. And so there's a data tab on our website where the API endpoints are located. So the users can see all of those and access those if they're familiar with that. Otherwise, like we mentioned, the GIS stuff is mostly available through Nebraska Map. What else do we have? We've got several ways of getting the data, but we also have um, emails that go out through Gov Delivery to update people when changes are made to those data sets so that if they've incorporated an API or a GIS uh, feature service into one of their applications, if we're gonna make a change that will alter their application, they get an email uh, notifying them ahead of time before the change is made. So we do a little bit of change management on that aspect too, so we're not breaking other people's applications. So like Ryan said, it would be a good idea to sign up for that Gov Delivery. If you're listening to this, yeah, you should sign up for Gov Delivery. And how can people sign up for the Gov Delivery? There's a big green button on our website that says sign up for Gov Delivery. Okay. Uh, we will attach the any emails or websites or any kind of links to this podcast. So just I'm not look sure what page that's on, but uh, there is a button that Pam put up there to help people um, sign up for that. Okay. That I sounds good. And there's one on the underneath data, the data tab as well on our page. Okay, so before we end this podcast, um, I'm going to ask that if you could only eat one type of food for the rest of your life, what would it be? Pizza. Pizza? Like breakfast pizza, taco pizza? There's so many different pizzas. I know, but that's why. It'd be pizza. I could choose whichever pizza I wanted then, right? That's true. Yeah. Okay. All right, Jeff? French fries. What? You can't do french fries. You should do, like, potatoes. And then you could do, like, french fries, mashed potatoes, like, au gratin potatoes. No. Just french fries? Yes. So, like, loaded french fries, sweet potato french fries? Just french fries. (laughs) Pretty generic. I'll give you a specific one. Uh, Spicy garlic grilled chicken wings from Endzone in Lincoln. That for the rest of your life? Yeah, they're pretty good. Okay. Not good. (laughs) Maybe we'll get sponsored by Enzone and they can bring in all the... <laughs> well, I just want to thank you all for taking the time to talk to us. And if anybody has any questions specifically for Kim, Jeff, or Ryan, uh, feel free to reach out. And we'll put in the links to um, any kind of, I guess, portals, web addresses that they mentioned here. But thanks again for being on the show.
Hi everyone, welcome back. Today it's me, Devin, and... And Alexa, hi. And we're here with water planning, Jennifer and Ryan. Hi guys. Hi. Hello. Yeah, do you guys just want to kind of introduce yourselves and what you do at the department and give us a rundown of just what you do? Sure thing. Uh, I'm Jennifer Shellpepper. I am the water planning division manager. And that means I do a lot of things. I talk to lots of people, I have lots of staff, and we have the privilege of getting to meet people all across the state and discuss with them what's going on in their area. Uh, what's their water supply look like? Are they having any problems? And we work with them to address those issues and get the water supply and uh, demands back into balance. So that's a pretty big overview of what we yeah. do, but that's what I get to do. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, sure. My name is Ryan Kelly. I am the uh, coordinator for the Upper Platte region of, of the state. Um, that is in the western portion of the state. So uh, like Jennifer said, we get a, a great opportunity to go uh, and visit a lot of parts of the state, but my, my portion that I specialize is in that area. So um, as Jennifer mentioned, we are all about kind of making sure water supplies are sustainable for, for water users throughout the state. So that is our big focus, and that entails a whole lot of stuff and a whole lot of conversations. So Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we talked to Andy and Sam already about the Republican and the drought efforts that are going on within the Republican Basin. Can you tell us a little bit more about water planning's drought efforts that aren't in the Republican Sure, we can do that. I can uh, give you a little bit of background and just, you know, where we start is with stakeholders. And it's really just stakeholders, stakeholders, stakeholders all the time. They are driving our processes. And in the Upper Platte, that really started a number of years ago when we first started doing integrated management planning. But most recently, we went through a basin-wide planning effort. And the outcome of that for integrated management plan was that we needed drought planning done in the Upper Platte Basin. And so we followed up with that. And now in the new plan, we have until 2029 to get a basin-wide plan, as well as integrated management, well, drought planning efforts for each NRD. So that's gonna be six plans total that are all drought plan focused in the Upper Platte. Can you briefly explain what the difference is between an integrated management plan and a basin-wide plan in case people listening don't know? Sure, an integrated management plan is where we focus the plan on just one natural resources district. It is joint with our department and that natural resources district, uh, but it's just that one district, whereas basin-wide involves multiple NRDs and the state. That sounds like a lot of coordination between multiple NRDs throughout the state and the basin. How mm -hmm. does that how does that work, meeting different stakeholders, getting together to all agree on something? That seems pretty pretty difficult. It takes a lot of coordination. As you mentioned, we've got to get folks together at different levels, different times, different conversations, but making sure that we're always communicating across all of those borders uh, so that we're consistent. And it's important because water flows downhill, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't care that there's an NRD boundary or a state boundary for that matter. And so it's very important that we make sure that because the water's moving across those boundaries and borders, that we're also doing our planning across those boundaries and borders. Awesome. So after you meet with the different stakeholder groups, what happens next in, let's say, a drought plan? Sure. So we put together the plan based upon feedback from those folks. Um, gosh, it can be really a lot of different activities that are recommended, projects that are suggested by those folks. Um, and depending upon what it could be, we could just focus on communication. We could actually develop projects. You just never know where you're going to end up when you have a group of stakeholders. But that's the best part about having them is that they bring issues to the table that we don't think of. And that's why they're really critical to the process. And sorry, I'm just like spitballing no, questions. Go for it. <laughs> um, what are some different examples of stakeholders that, you know, can be involved in this planning process? Sure, I can I can talk to that. Um, all, all manner of people. So anybody out there that uses water. So um, I can think of a few very specific ones aside from, you know, Everyone, but um, some, <laughs> some of the specific uh, people that we want to bring to the table that, that, that we're concerned with are, of course, people involved with agriculture. 
um, maybe some people that are involved with some of the finances of the agriculture, maybe emergency managers, maybe, let's see, municipalities, of course, because there's people within cities and jurisdictions that are, of course, want to, want to keep their water supplies solid and going. Agriculture, other state agencies, other, uh, other counties, municipalities, natural resource districts, as Jen said, canal districts, uh, reclamation districts, federal governments. Um, we want to bring everybody the, to the table just because everybody has their own unique perspective, right? And if you don't, you don't give everybody a seat, then somebody's going to say, well, hey, somebody, you want to be as fair and equitable as you can and as, as the water will allow you to do. So I think that's the plan, the area, and kind of your goal. And, and this isn't for just drought planning. That just defines who, what kind of plan, who you bring to the table, essentially. So what you want to accomplish. But all those people usually have a seat at the table for a drought plan because drought, you know, is not a, a small occurrence. It is mm-hmm. regional. So. so how long does that take to get everybody together, you know, to send out public notices, to get the plan, like, developed and adopted? That sounds like it would take years. You would be correct. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly right. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. For our, our typical integrated management planning process, that's about three years, but it can be up to five years. And so what I've seen from drought planning is it seems to be pretty similar. You've got a couple year range, maybe all the way up to five years. It just depends on the particular group you're engaging and the types of issues that you need to address. Of course, where there's more conflict, you need a little more time to talk about those hard issues. Yeah, and, and it also depends on who's, you know, as, as much as we'd like to do, do to do this all for free and, and, and make this happen, it depends on who's paying the bill. So um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, you know, if the state's doing it, we have some control over, we have a little bit more control over what we're doing, but there's still a long process, right? But if we're looking towards federal entities or maybe local entities or grant processes or something like that, it, it takes a little bit, you know, there's application processes and there's other things involved in that too. And um, that takes time as well. And um, it's just, it's, it's why having a concentrated effort that's not going to, you know, fade over time, where we definitely want to do something about drought, like Jen said, this has been a long time coming, and it'll be a long time going in the future, too, so. Yeah, so emphasis on the planning and water planning, but yeah. also drought planning is, mm-hmm. you know, you want to be prepared for it. Um, so I might be jumping ahead in my question here, but we had Ryan Warner on talking about the Lower Platte Drought Monitoring Dashboard. Mm-hmm. Can you talk a little bit about maybe like that plan of how that came about? Talk like a little bit about the data. What does that represent? Sure, I can give you just a little bit of background there. So in the Lower Platte Basin, there was a pretty significant drought in the year 2012. And that really spurred a lot of action from the local natural resources districts in that area to say, hey, we want to be proactive, uh, but especially the city of Lincoln, because the city of Lincoln does have well fields that are dependent upon the flows in the river. And when the flows in the river got really low in 2012, uh, folks in Lincoln might remember that they were out there with signs on the street Mm -hmm. that said, hey, here's how much water we're using today. Everybody, this is our target. Let's use a little bit of less water. Um, And so that really brought the parties together there to say, hey, we need to do something. That's where we went to get some federal funds, some state matching funds, and put together a drought plan. Uh, That drought plan has been in place for a couple of years now, and that's where that dashboard really has come from. And Ryan's done a great job with his team to put that together, so I'll let him speak about some specifics on that dashboard. Sure, sure. And thanks, Jen. And there's um, there's a lot of, like, what, what you'd call quote-unquote triggers in that plan that, that Jen talked about that got established that essentially if we cross such and such a line within drought parameters, then it triggers uh, certain statuses within the, the, the members of that plan. So um, the, that's, the, uh, that's the Lower Platte Drought Consortium, and that includes um, the Lincoln, the, the municipal area of Lincoln, Omaha, Lower Platte North, Lower Platte South, and Papua, Missouri. Uh, yes, Papua, Papua, Missouri, NRD. So within those five areas, um, we, we do drought monitoring and we look at some nationally available data, some locally available data, some stream gauging data, some proprietary uh, stream gauging data, and that all in, it kind of works together to give us as 
near real time. So real time in the sense that it's updated daily, but it gives us that information to look at those triggers and say, okay, well, when such and such events happen and we, we can kind of combine what it says in the plan to say, well, consortium members, we are in what is what we have defined ourselves as severe drought. So that lets us think, okay, well, we've been in severe drought. Okay. It, have we been in there for a day, a week, a month, a year? What do we want our, our communication strategy to be? What, what, do we, what do we want our actions to be because we've been in severe drought for X amount of time? That's kind of what we uh, allow folks to see on that visually on that dashboard. So anyone can go and see that, not just people, not just drought members or drought consortium members, excuse me. But, um, and then it, we also put some, uh, public information up there too. So there's a lot of other drought indices that uh, many, many folks can use. And yeah, it's, it's been a good, great endeavor and we've got, received great feedback. So. so, and this might not be directly re- related, but back in 2012, when we had experienced that extreme drought, were, was it our agency that put forth like those recommended restrictions on water consumption or who does that specifically? No, we do not do that. That was done by the city of Lincoln themselves. And okay. I think that's something that's preserved in the current drought consortium membership, in the current drought plan. Each individual entity, so the NRDs, the cities of Lincoln, city of Omaha, and, and DNR, continue to retain each of our own statutorial, uh, statutory authorities. And mm-hmm. none of that has changed. So that would be the city of Lincoln in 2012 who took those actions. Okay, and with the data that we have with that drought dashboard, they can better make better decisions. Is, yes. Okay, awesome. Yep. And I would say it addressed, you know, something that happened is people didn't know, right? Mm-hmm. Whose responsibility is it when the 2012 draft happened? That was a question a lot of people asked. And so that's really one of the main focuses of this drought plan is to have the communication available between all of those parties. And so when we talk to the public, we can put out a clear message about who is responsible for what and who the public should contact when they have a question. Those are really good questions to be answered, too. It sounds like this um, monitoring dashboard is kind of like a poster child for what ideally we'd want to happen throughout the state. Uh, or it supplies the data that we yeah, can better. Yeah, like some... It, sure, sure. Um, it, 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 it co- currently co- correlates with our drought planning efforts. Now, there's other agencies within the state that we, we'd connect to, to to create kind of a statewide look at things. But, yes, it, this is some information that's important whether or not you're in a consortium or a group that monitors drought right Mm -hmm. this is important if you're just a member of the public if you're out there and you can you can kind of see what drought conditions look like and kind of understand what the what the you know for lack of a better term what the tea leaves are telling you they're much better than tea leaves they're (laughs) they're satellite based tea leaves but um lots of them but um if you can kind of look at that and then as a member of the public and just a member of educated community then yeah that's that's very important yeah um, so you were talking about different kinds of funding sources. How does that come about? Do we do you apply for federal grants? Do the different entities within, um, like the NRDs, the Basin, help like supply funds? How does that work? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Uh, the source that we've been primarily using is from the Bureau of Reclamation, and that's a federal agency, and they deal with water supply normally, uh, especially with surface water districts. That's a lot of what they deal with. But these current grants are focused on drought resiliency and drought mitigation. And so they are a great tool for us to bring in that funding. And not only that, they open you up to a next level of funding where not only will they pay for your plan, but they'll also pay for projects or some portion of projects. So bringing in those federal dollars has proven to be a great asset to the state and has really stretched the state tax dollars when we can bring in those matching funds. That We're bringing in about 50% matching funds, I believe, on, on those grants right now. That's pretty good. That's a lot of match. So I've heard this term be kind of tossed around. Um, what about like a water smart grant? How does that play into everything? That is a type of grant that is administered by the Bureau of Reclamation. So they have a number of different types uh, of water smart grants. And they've also just within the last year or so gotten a lot more types because of some federal funding that became available to them. So there's it's a specific kind of, you know, category of grants that the BOR administers that allows for contingency planning, which we're doing. Like Jen mentioned, resiliency planning. There's also a lot of new grants out there for kind of modeling effort. So really it's anything and everything almost that has to do with water supplies and, you know, making sure that you're prepared and planning and then identifying projects that can provide mitigation and then taking action 
action on those projects, the Water Smart Grant is involved in that. So that's a very, very crucial and, and increasingly available supply for those federal dollars. So kudos to the to the BOR for making more dollars available. <laughs> We hope to we hope to get some. <laughs> we hope to get that money. So I also heard um, through the grapevine that you're working on something in the upper plat. How what's happening with the upper plat? Is it similar to the lower plat kind of stakeholder engagement planning process? Yeah, yeah, and um, so that kind of started out as uh, similar to the lower plat is in that uh, it was stakeholder driven. So that the basin wide plan that we talked about a little earlier is in a in in the second increment there. So essentially. What they said is, as I think Jen mentioned, is they all, we, we want to have a drought plan for each individual NRD by 2029. And what this, uh, what, what's going on right now in the upper plat is we have one of those water smart grants. So for that drought contingency, so we have a 50% match from the BOR to be able to create that plan. And there's a couple NRDs in that area that already have a drought plan, but those that don't can use this larger federal one that we're creating as a basis for their drought plan for their basin-wide plan requirements. And also it's, it's you know, as Jen said, water doesn't really, water flows downhill and there's geographic, there's man-made borders that it kind of, you know, it could, it could care less whether or not exists or not. But in the same in the same way, from west to east on the, the state of Nebraska, right? There's a change in climate, so and that happens within even the um, the Upper Platte Basin. So what that allows us to do is bring people together that maybe are from different climates and have different concerns. So even in a local regional locality, we there's still stakeholders from you know many many different perspectives that need to come together, chat discuss what water conservation, what what a drought contingency plan looks like to all of them within the basin. So um, so something just kind of popped on my head. It's not necessarily drought related, but it sounds like water planning does a lot of versatile work. Um, so you must have a pretty awesome team with a wide variety of skill sets to make this happen, right? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, we, we really have an amazing team of folks who work for us. Uh, we've got folks with really mad GIS skills. We've got groundwater modelers, surface water modelers, folks who know and understand how to work with big data sets because these models are not small. Uh, They are on a half mile grid cell or even a quarter mile grid cell depending upon where you're at. And so we have to have the systems in place, the programs in place to be able to handle those massive, massive data sets. Uh, so that's all on the tech side, right? And then there's the planning side. So we were talking earlier about, oh, the logistics and how much time does this take? So all of those people are really great too, the ones who make sure we are prepared for those meetings, make sure we've got the public notices out, make sure we have an agenda and a plan. So when we're talking to these stakeholders, they have interesting things to talk about. They have the facts sitting in front of them and we have a plan to get through all of these difficult conversations. Those are all of the things that the water planning staff do. So a huge variety and a very, I think, from my perspective, at least engaging reason to do that work, to get out there to help the folks in the state of Nebraska, help people understand what their water supply is, what the water uses are, and discuss those issues so that we can better manage that water across the state. That's beautiful. (laughs) Um, I don't know if we already mentioned it, but do you guys have any, like, upcoming meetings that you can plug right now, or...? Well, uh, within the Upper Platte Drought Contingency Plan, we have some stakeholder meetings that are going to kick off again uh, early next year. So we're going to, those all, those are all going to be public noticed. So so it's going to be, everybody's going to be welcome to come to the table and give their input. So those are a couple of the big ones that we have coming out West. Um, we always have meetings. There's, there's always, there's always something to do. There's always folks to talk to and not, not always with drought, drought planning, but it all, it all ties together. So if we don't manage the water in times of plenty, we can't manage it that well in times of, of, of lean. So mm-hmm. So oh, I like that. That's good. <laughs> so, well, and I'd also add to Jen, I mean, not only do we have an awesome water planning division, but you guys talk to IT, right? Oh, yeah. We have an awesome, yeah. de- we have an awesome department. So yeah. there's certain things that we, like, you know, I myself have said, hey, this, this would look cool, wouldn't it? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, they asked me, how would you do that? And I'm like, I don't know. You're the IT. Or, <laughs> you're the person that doesn't. You know, I've just said it look cool. Just make it look cool. So, um, so we have an awesome just department in general. So uh, it's great to be a part of a department that's 100 plus a few people that are all devoted to the same thing. And to be around people who, you know, who are comfortable, join their nerd side every day. It's amazing. So. Yeah, we have a lot of nerds. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, we have a lot of like experts and very knowledgeable people um, within their own fields and divisions, and you know we do uh, collaborate a lot here, so that's awesome. Um, I have a question, just kind of just thinking about this. Anybody listening to this podcast, what's something that you want them to know about water planning? It doesn't have to be related to drought at all. Just what's something that if they're going to have a takeaway message, what is that? I think I'd touch on what I said earlier, that it's not, water planning is not just a sometimes job. It's, you're always planning. You're always thinking of ways, not thinking, but this like searching for ways and discovering ways and utilizing best practices and looking for ways to preserve water in Nebraska, right? So for that user who has water right now, who's using, who's able to irrigate, you always want to say, hey, what my job is for you is to make sure in 50 years, if you're still there, you're getting on that same land, that you still have a water supply to be able to do that. So that's that's a huge thing that we do. And it's not just sometimes that we don't come in, you know, we don't come in from in irrigation season only and kind of, well, it's irrigation season, we better ramp up. It's 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 365 days a year and it's it's super important to us. So it's and it's super important to Nebraska. So I'd say we're here all the time and we're we always have the best interests of the water users in Nebraska in mind. And from the director to to everybody within the, the department. So um, that's what I'd say. I think you said it perfectly earlier when you said planning in times of plenty and planning in times of lean. I think that is all yeah. encompassing of mm-hmm. water planning. I'd say water planning is awesome. <laughs> Short, uh, but very related to what Ryan said. And I, I use this, uh, the governor had a drought conference this past summer that we participated in. And one of the things, a question that's asked is, when is the best time to plant a tree? Do any of you know the answer to that question? All the time. Yesterday. <laughs> yesterday. yesterday. <laughs> and the same thing is true for water planning. When was the best time to start water planning? Yesterday. yesterday. Oh, I also like Love that. that. <laughs> we should have these with, like, posters of, like, cats throughout the... <laughs> Oh, these one-liners for inspiration. Awesome. <laughs> I love that. For each division, kind of yeah. where they're all in their cubicles. Yeah. Like, just another poster for each one. That's great. I have one other thought that might be of interest to people. You know, we've been talking about the Upper Platte a lot mm-hmm. um, and water planning, but a word that uh, we haven't mentioned is over-appropriated. Mm-hmm. And really, that's driving a lot of what we do, everything we do in the Upper Platte, is the fact that it was declared over-appropriated back in 2004. Can you go ahead and explain what a over-appropriated means for those at home? Because <laughs> <Yes. laughs> yes. I know what that means. <laughs> that means there was a recognition that there was some overdevelopment in the basin. So we have more demand for the water than there is supply of water in that area. And so that makes it the conversation's a little more difficult up there because we're talking about reducing uses or coming up with ways to increase the supply at times when we might not have enough. And that started, again, back in 2004. So we've been talking about this and planning this a long time. But all of that conversation since 2004 is what led us to a focus on drought planning because that's really when those stakeholders in the overappropriate basin said, hey, we are seeing that drought is when we really have this problem. If we are not in a drought situation, we have the water we need. We're able to meet everybody's demands. But during that time of drought, there is not enough water. We're seeing some economic impacts to existing water users. And so those are the folks that we're trying to protect. And mm-hmm. so that is, again, driving what we're doing there and why we're focused on drought planning now in that upper plat over appropriated basin area. I have one final question for you two. Um, if you could only have one food or one category of food for the rest of your life, what would it be? And we will judge you on your answer. This, this is a very important question. What is a category of food, exactly? <laughs> I'm going to go with steak. Okay, Ryan. I'm gonna go with I'm gonna go with this is this is a category, but I'm gonna go with roasted vegetables because oh, they are see. very very versatile. And okay. You can you can season them a lot of different ways. You can eat them cold or hot. I, <laughs> I've I've eaten enough roasted vegetables in one sitting to get sick. So <laughs> I don't know if that's a, that's a brag or that's a please edit that. <laughs> Help. So. Uh, we'll take it as both, and we like your answers. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I have a question though. Can you like okay? Roasted vegetables. Is, can you make that a dessert out of that? Yeah, put some whipped cream on it. <laughs> I can. 
What is pumpkin pie? Sweet potato pie. Oh my gosh, I love candied yams. Okay, perfect answer, actually. (laughs) I think that's the winner. I'm going to say that that's the winner. Okay, but you're a vegetarian. (laughs) That that is true. (laughs) Okay, well, thanks for playing. So I guess I just want to say that whenever we post this podcast, we will definitely um, include links to Water Planning's webpage. We'll include the Lower Platte Monitoring Dashboard, um, any kind of location to go for public notices or anything. So if you have any questions, just call the department or feel free to reach out to Jenna Ryan. But thank you so much for talking with us. We really appreciate yeah, it. Thank and you, guys. We loved thank your you. food answers. <laughs> yes, that was great. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, hi everybody. We have Sam and Andy here. They are members of the water planning uh, division team at DNR. Um, if you want to just introduce yourselves and maybe tell us a little bit about what you do here at DNR. All right, I'm Sam Caps. I'm the coordinator for the Republican Basin. So basically, I manage all the activities, all of Nebraska's activities for the Republican River Compact between Nebraska, Kansas, and Colorado. That includes working with the three states and various meetings that we do and our modeling efforts that we do in data collection and working with the NRDs to develop plans and make sure that they are managing their water in a way that we can meet compact compliance. And I'm Andy Pedley. I'm a coordinator for the voluntary IMP uh, districts in the state. So primarily I work in the Niobrara Basin and the Blue Basin. Prior to that, I did a lot of work with Sam on conducting a drought scenario exercise in the Republican Basin. Um, So I think that's probably why I'm here for this conversation. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. um, So this podcast is focusing on um, DNR's planning mitigation efforts in times of drought as in this year. So can you talk a little bit about the Republican drought exercise? Like, was it difficult to get started? How was it incorporating all the different stakeholders? I feel like that sounds like a logistic nightmare. The drought exercise getting started really wasn't all that much of a challenge because it was a requirement of the basin-wide plan, I think 2019, I think was when that uh, was adopted. So the plan called for DNR and the NRDs to work together to hold a drought scenario exercise. It was pretty broad in its kind of uh, scope, just said that we needed to do that and then have a follow-up report and recommend any sort of changes or types of things that we found uh, found out in the exercise itself. And I think it is a basis for determining whether or not the Republican NRDs and DNR wanted to do a basin-wide drought plan, which we are moving forward with. Yeah, after that, that's what I was going to ask is what's the purpose of the exercise? So it's to go ahead forward with a drought plan between um, the NRDs and us, right? Yeah, and it's to so that the report itself, the drought report, will feed into the five-year technical re- analysis that will be done. Part of statute on the basin-wide plans is every five years you have to do kind of like an overview of what's been done in the previous five years. So we look at the data, have have we been able to be in com- compliance with the compact with the way that we do accounting and modeling and water management, but then also what changes we can possibly include in, in you know, a second draft of the, of the basin-wide plan. So we have to have a report to the legislature in early 2024, I believe. So that drought report will also feed into that five-year analysis that we will talk about what we've done, the progress that we've made, and then what our plans are going forward. Sounds like a lot of moving pieces and parts. <laughs> <laughs> That's so what we do. <laughs> how did the exercise go? What was like the main outcome besides the report? Like, did it went well? Did you have a lot of engagement, a lot of feedback? Yeah. So I think I think it was. A pretty awesome exercise. It was very timely. So in the beginning of 2022, we were already starting to experience drought conditions within the Republican Basin and throughout Nebraska. So we kind of modeled the different scenarios, the first couple scenarios off of what was actually happening in 2022, which I think was helpful. We held the exercise in May, so it was right as people, producers, the NRDs and and DNR were all gearing up, already thinking about drought, how we're going to manage through the summer of 2022 with drought. So that was, I think, something that engaged people, I think, a little bit more and was very timely and relevant, so it was on people's minds. So I think we probably had a little bit more participation from certain stakeholders 
because of that. Um, we had some fires in the Republican Basin during the spring of 2022. So then it became, they were wind-driven events that were caused by, because there was such, such, such dry conditions in the basin. So I think that was another thing that kind of brought people's interest in. Um, I think it was a really great exercise. And I think what kind of came out of it was a couple things. One, I think the NRDs, we've kind of all agreed that we feel that the way that they manage their water will continue to keep us in compliance with the compact through drought years and dry years. And then it also really was a place where you could just start developing those relationships. So any kind of disaster that you're dealing with, if you are only talking to people when a drought happens, when a flood happens, when a fire happens, any kind of major kind of natural disaster, you're not really gonna get the buy-in, you're not gonna get the, the cooperation. If you're building those relationships ahead of time and you develop those relationships prior to an event happening, managing it and responding to and recovering from those disasters are going to be a lot easier. So I think it helped to solidify some of the communication efforts that we need to do and identified that we need to work a little bit better on DNR knows what they're doing. The NRDs know what we're, they're doing. It's really how do we communicate that with the public? How do we com communicate that with producers, with irrigators, so that everybody knows what to expect either in a drought year or in a compact call year, mm -hmm. which happens in the Republican whenever it gets designated as such. One of the biggest things that came out of it for me was the realization that everybody kind of had after looking at the data and just working through the exercise that drought is not necessarily just a disaster and that we need to look at drought and flood events. So high water years and then low water years as a natural cycle within the basin. So if we're not dealing with drought, then we should be planning for it. And like our perspective as a whole should just always kind of focus on, we know we go through these cycles and years of drought and excess water so whether it's flooding or a lot of precipitation that we basically manage from a perspective that at any minute we could be thrown into that drought and we're ready for it that was a lot yeah. <laughs> you know i think i think one of the other um positives that came out of it is this along with some of the other drought planning efforts in the state has sort of started the conversation with some other other agencies in the state on statewide drought planning efforts like we do have a statewide drought plan that was drafted in 2000, I believe. But so we've got basin drought plans, we've got hazard mitigation plans that focus on drought. NRDs have NRDs individual have drought, plans. drought plans for their own districts. Uh, so there is drought planning being done in the state. I feel like this scenario brought together some of the decision makers in kind of how drought planning is done and started a conversation on how we're going to maybe combine or use the existing drought plans and make sure that they kind of work well together. You know, I don't think that a new statewide drought plan is necessarily in the in the works, but conversations are being had between these agencies to see how, you know, maybe we can figure out a way to 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 make sure that there's some commonality throughout throughout the planning process. Because drought affects a bunch of different sectors, right? There's the agriculture sector, then there's the, the emergency management side of things that has with wildfires and, and, and things like that. So it's it's more than just, you know, our drought plans would focus on water quantity primarily. And, you know, hazard mitigation drought plans focus on, you know, maybe drought is a larger sort of concept, focusing on emergency management, things like that. So there's drought planning going on. It's done sort of by separate groups with separate goals and areas of focus. Areas maybe? of focus, yeah. yeah. And, and and I think for that reason, statewide, like an overall statewide drought plan is just... It's difficult. It would be difficult. Yeah, I mean, the different areas of Nebraska range in yeah. like land use precipitation. And drought is, a, it's a different kind of hazard, right? So it's not a big storm that just blows up your town mm -hmm. um, where you just come in and, and the idea is you're cleaning up after the fact and rebuilding and getting back to normal. Drought is a slow onset some, most of the time. I mean, there are the flash, flash droughts, droughts, which yeah. are kind of like quick onset. But it's something that if you're not planning for and preparing for and just managing your resources on a day-to-day -day basis, a yearly basis, if you're not already doing that work when a drought happens, like you're not going to be able to you're respond so to it. Yeah, yeah, you're yeah. kind of screwed. Am I allowed to say that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're just already behind. Yeah, you're, uh, you're going to have a lot more difficult time. If you wait until the event happens to start talking and building a relationship, no one knows what each other's doing. So I think if nothing else, it'll better prepare all of the different state agencies to have an understanding of what, you know, what does Department of Ag do? What does DNR do? What do 
NDE or some of the other agencies, you know, how are they impacted by drought and what are they're, they going to do to respond? So hopefully that's what we can kind of move that state drought plan into. Yeah. Yeah. You, you bring up a good point. So thinking about the different um, state agencies or local communities, like they probably all have a different perspective on what drought is and how it impacts them. Um, so having kind of like a centralized, I don't even know if I would say like One area. size fits all. Yeah. yeah. That wouldn't really work no. regardless of the state but then of its purposes too. But knowing your resources of who to go and where you need to be to talk to to get those, I think is really important. I mean, the Republican Basin, because of the compact, I think is, I don't know how I want to say this, like it is a beast. but It's its own beast. Yeah, Yeah. it's its own beast, (laughs) but it has that kind of established foundation for communication between the NRDs, the Mm -hmm. stakeholders. So probably a good example for all the other basins within the state. Yeah, I've kind of learned as I've taken on the Republican I feel lucky that I have the Republican. I mean, I know some people don't always want to work within the framework of the rules and regulations, but we have a lot of stuff really clearly defined for us of what we are supposed to do, what we can do, what we can't do. So we have DNR and the NRDs have done a great job of really kind of figuring out what's best management practices. How do we actually stay in compliance? And so because of that, I think we'll we'll sustain possibly better than maybe other areas with the state that don't have as much structure and framework around it to kind of dictate how things are managed. But even in the Republican, I think one of the things that the NRD managers expressed was just them having a better relationship with their stakeholders and their local districts, right? So, I mean, it's everything from communicating and messaging to the irrigators and the irrigation districts of what's actually going to happen during a drought year or during a compact call year, which tends to get triggered during drier seasons, right? It's possible to have a compact call year and not be in a drought, but if you're in a drought, you're almost guaranteed to be in a compact call year. Um, So it it helps them figure out, they realize that they need to do a better job of communicating with the public and even just the general public. But the other thing that they realized was the NRD structure is actually a great place to have communications to actually respond to things like wildland fires, right? So they had a a couple different fires in the Tribasin NRD and in the middle Republican. And so one of the things that came out of that exercise was to build a communication network with the local fire departments, with the local farmers, because when you have rural fire districts going out and fighting wildland fires or grass fires, if they know what equipment uh, farmers have to help cut fire lines, that's something that's invaluable instead of when you're in the middle of a fire having to figure out who can I go to to help us cut fire lines, right? Because the DNR and even the Forest Service to some extent doesn't necessarily have that equipment on hand, but farmers, they are like invaluable during wildland fires. Um, Figuring out helping Uh, local fire departments figure out whose well they could possibly tap for a water source. So in Lincoln, you have LFR, Lincoln Fire. They hook up to hydrants, so they get their water supply from hydrants. (laughs) When you're in a rural department, you have tankers. And basically, you could have to theoretically drive an extended distance just to be able to refill your tankers with water. So if you have NRD wellheads that have the, the connections already set up to where a fire department can hook onto that and get water. If you have farmers that you can kind of call on almost like a phone tree to say like turn your pivots on in these areas to help mitigate and keep the fire at bay. If you can have individual farmers that are willing to have those fittings also on on their wells so that the local fire departments can access water quicker and even just that the NRDs are a little bit more aware of what goes on if they need to start doing aerial firefighting efforts and pulling water out of ponds or lakes or some of the reservoirs. So Yeah, I think, um, at least for me, I didn't realize that... Well, I mean, you kind of put two and two with like dry and fire, but not necessarily like drought and fire. And Mm -hmm. that was something that really hit home during the Republican. So I think that's really awesome that that communication was established between everybody to try and mitigate those efforts if they happen again. Yeah, another thing on that same sort of vein with the wildfires, Tri-Basin, so they've got an allocation um, for the amount of groundwater that can be pumped over the course of three years. Is that right? Yeah, in one of their townships. And they, some of the, I guess, creative thinking or quick action or whatever by the NRD, they, they were able to suspend some of those allocations in order for producers to utilize that groundwater for for fire suppression. So, you know, even if it's not kind of like the big, large-scale sort of dynamic communication between agencies and things like that, even figuring out how to solve problems 
on a small scale, like this allocation and, issue. Yeah, and respond is, in real time. Yeah. Because I think, I think really Tri Basin's board kind of just said, use whatever water you need. I think they I think they were on their last year of their allocation. Um, I think it's a three-year allocation period. So they basically just said, we're pretty much suspending the allocation for that township for this year. I think Middle Republican or some, I think it was in Middle Republican. They did something similar. They didn't just blanket say, there's no more allocation, but they pretty much told people, use the water that you need to. Because... You know, the idea of turn your pivots on to stop the fires, to wet your fields down as the fires kind of move through. Because when those, those were wind-driven events, right? So they were like, we had very high winds, incredibly dry temperatures. So pretty much it just ripped through an area and it was very fast moving. So they were able to basically tell people whatever you need to do for fire suppression, whether it's to wet your fields down and just to get it to where it's not going to light on fire as much whether it was to water cover crops just to have some kind of ground cover because they pretty much had 1930s style dust storms out there right mm-hmm. after the fires. Some of the canals and ditches and stuff were pretty much just full of debris that had gotten blown. So to use it for that context, um, so whatever it was, their boards were able to kind of make those quick decisions of how do we kind of adjust and allow people to use the water. Yeah, so do you think that the drought exercise kind of helped that proactive mentality of, all right, we feel like we're pretty well established in communication, at least within compliance of the compact, but starting that talk of, all right, what about other natural disasters or like being... I guess, proactive in that planning aspect of not necessarily thinking of drought as a natural disaster, but a cyclical cycle that's going to happen. Let's be prepared. Yeah. I don't know that it really, I feel like in general, we as a collective, we are better prepared for other disasters that come in. I think tornadoes and storms and those type of things and floods, we have good response mechanisms. So I don't know that it prompted the NRDs to think more on what they were doing. Otherwise, what I think really came out of it is them realizing that the public, the producers, the irrigators and the irrigation districts don't necessarily know what's going to happen during a drought year, mm-hmm. right? So what uh, controls are going to be put on? So surface water users could get shut down. Groundwater users could get shut down. There's a process that goes into play, at least from the compact perspective. So they realize that they need to do and we need to all work together to build a better communications type plan to message that out to the public, whether that's through communicating through social media or various things, developing dashboards for people to understand what water usage is going on, and even just holding public meetings and putting out information of like here at DNR, we in preparation, for us calling a compact call year, put a handout together that basically just laid out what does that mean, right? So December 1st, this happens, you know, laid out the generic, generally the steps that DNR and the NRDs are going to take to determine what kind of surface water management needs, or not just surface water, but what water management needs to happen during a compact year so people kind of know what to expect. So I think that was maybe the biggest thing that it was like their aha moment from the NRDs was just really improving the communication between them, us, and the public. It's good to know, too, that (coughs) next month's podcast will be on the Republican, so Sam will be back with Jesse, and we'll elaborate more on what a compact call year is or any kind of terms that maybe aren't necessarily known. So do you have any kind of takeaways to give to anybody listening, whether it's a citizen or an NRD stakeholder or manager, about the drought exercise and maybe like what it meant to you or just, I don't know, a motivational like wrap up of everything that you've learned from it? For me, it was interesting. I come from an environmental studies background. So, you know, drought and climate issues have always kind of been an interest. Um, So it was good to get my hands dirty in that sort of realm. I think the big take home for me is that in Nebraska, we are pretty fortunate in the way that we manage our water. And I think that is sort of set us up to be more resilient during drought than maybe some other other states. And my big takeaway then was, yeah, we have, for the most part, the policy in place to get us through these sort of situations. But we can always improve on communication and how that message is presented to the public, what sorts of resources agencies can sort of bring together and get that multiplier effect on on being effective in mitigating drought, things like that. It was encouraging that we have a lot of really good policy in place, but also is eye-opening in the sense that we really need to improve on our communication and, and messaging. 
but I think that's kind of yeah, we can always to be expected in most situations. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, things are always changing, data sources, yeah. technologies being updated. Yeah. But yeah, I would agree. I think we're pretty fortunate in Nebraska. We manage our water pretty well compared to compared to other places. Yeah. And I think for me, like my background is actually in disaster, whether it's management or the science of natural disasters. Quite frankly, I'm a giant disaster geek. So, <laughs> um, I started DNR in May of 20. 2021. And this was one of the first things I got to work on. So I was super excited because I personally, I'm a on a volunteer fire department because there's a part of me that wants to be involved in the actual, you know, managing, responding and recovering from disasters. But I love working in water. So in a way, coming to DNR and the work that I did when I worked at ND and water quality, I was always missing that kind of disaster component, or I was always trying to figure out how to still kind of have that incorporated into the work that we do. So for me, it was awesome to come into DNR. And that was one of the first things I got to work on with Andy was this drought exercise and just drought planning in general, because it, it's all connected, right? So like the better relationships you have, the more everybody's talking to each other, understands what resources are Everybody has understands what they're going to do when something actually happens, the better we're going to be to protect our state and to protect the people. So it was super cool for me to be able to jump into DNR. And one of the first things I got to do was to kind of stick with the path that I started on. So I think I just live from a perspective of disaster. <laughs> right? That's like, so weird to I, listen. It's, weird. <laughs> it's plan for the worst, hope for the best, yes, right? Yeah. So it's been very rewarding. And it was really awesome just to see that like we really in the Republican at least we really do kind of have things in place and it was nice to see that it's not us trying to figure out how are the energies going to respond but it gives us the ability to be more creative and do more outreach and kind of education with the public and that that's where we need to work on because I I'd rather be in that spot than trying to figure out oh man like we are way off balance it's also rewarding to see that all the work that's been done, which we'll talk more about next month when we talk about the Republican specifically, all the modeling, all the science, all the data analysis that we do, I think really is benefiting us, right? And we really are able to manage our, our water resources better because it's not always fun to have rules and regulations in place, but I think the framework of the Republican is a great example of how that can actually get you through difficult times. I love that. I feel like that was like the perfect uh, segue of kind of like ending <laughs> on something really sad and downing about the yeah. like statewide drought now is that something positive can come out of it. Yeah. So. And I think, you know, drought's just a difficult thing to manage and it's a more long term thing that we're constantly working towards. You know, even to the point of saying when we have really high flood years and excess flow years, can we capture that, right? Can we can mm -hmm. we store? And I know a lot of that's happening in the plat too, but I think that's one of the things that was one thing on top of the communication piece that the NRDs thought maybe we should look at a little bit more. Are there different projects that we can do to kind of capture those high flow years and store the water so that we're better prepared or even just looking into more recharge projects and various things? You know, how can we use the extra water that we get from Mother Nature in the years that we don't get it from her? Yeah, I love that. Uh, before I let you two go, I do have a question for you, kind of random. If you could only have one kind of food for the rest of your life, what would it be? Sushi. <laughs> That's a good answer. There's so many different kind types, of sushi. styles. <laughs> yeah, you could have it cooked raw. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, it's pretty versatile. Is coffee a uh, food? Does that count? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> I hate these questions because I don't, I don't know. I don't know that there's one thing I could do forever. I'd get sick of it. So I might join in with Andy on the sushi thing because at least you have a little variety. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, uh, thank you so much, Sam and Andy, for coming and talking to us. Uh, we will definitely post links uh, whenever this airs about um, any kind of material. So maybe we'll incorporate something about the exercise, the report. We'll definitely include stuff about the Republican Compact. And if you ever have questions on anything, please feel free to reach out to them um, or anybody else here in water planning at DNR. And thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for joining us, guys. Um, next, we'll be speaking with permits and registrations. Division head Mike Thompson.
Thanks for joining us, Mike. Today we're going to do a little bit of a deeper dive into the Permits and Registrations Division and the parts that they play. Hi, Mike. Thanks for speaking with us. Mike is the Division Head for our Permits and Registration Division. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your role at the department? Sure. I've been with the department for about 35 years. I originally started out in the field office. My first day on the job was going out and uh, refereeing a water shortage on the Little Limaha River southeast of Lincoln. Our division has uh, several functions. One of them is to issue surface water permits. So if somebody wants to store water or uh, take water out of a river to irrigate or other beneficial use, they have to come and get an application and we have to approve it. We also handle a couple of kinds of groundwater transfers, municipal groundwater transfers. For instance, the town of Lincoln or Omaha has municipal groundwater transfers. So we process those kinds of applications. And then we do all of the water well registration for the state. So when a water well is drilled, the water well contractor files paperwork with detailed information about the well construction and the uh, geologic log that is developed when the well is being drilled. So those are essentially the functions of our division. So as you know, this podcast is specifically focused on the Department of Natural Resources planning mitigation efforts on drought. So it sounds like you do a lot of permitting and applications. Do Does any of that process change during a drought? Do you have more applications, I would assume, on the well drilling? If it's a drought, people want to tap into different groundwater yeah, sources? We do. Um, there is definitely an uptick in the processing of forms relative to well drilling. Now, much of the state is in areas where there's ongoing planning and integrated management plans are in effect. And so sometimes the expansion of new wells is limited, but as you go to the eastern part of the state, say the eastern third, there's still some well development going on. And there's definitely an increase in interest in getting irrigation wells when the droughts come on. And also there's a lot of um, well servicing that goes on. So one of the things that our groundwater well registration section does is process um, information about modifications that are made to wells. So whenever that seal is broken in, the uh, contractor does some work, um, there's paperwork that follows up. And we definitely have seen an uptick and the drillers that we work with have told us that they were absolutely swamped this last summer with well servicing that they're primarily to keep the irrigators going and get, you know to keep their crops viable and to maximize their yields. Wow, so it sounds like during drought times you guys are pretty busy in your division, I would assume then, right? Lots of yes. communication with different construction companies, drillers, NRDs. What what right. is that what's that like? Well, we um, so one of the there's a nexus with the water well use and our permitting section. So there's a type of permitting that we call a conduct water permit, and uh, there's two different varieties. And in particular, and we notice an uptick of this in during droughty periods, is um, some folks that own water irrigation water wells are interested in using their water well to irrigate um, ground that maybe not is not immediately adjacent to the water well. So they will want to use a stream channel to pump water out of the well, let it flow downstream, and then pick it up at a different field to irrigate that field to try and expand the use of their water. Now we have to coordinate with the uh, Natural Resources District because that's considered a transfer of groundwater. And the Natural Resources Districts have and often do promulgate rules regarding how that can be done. And so one thing that we recently did was on the form that we have for folks to apply to use the stream is what we regulate. So we want to keep tabs on if there's non-native water in there to make sure that that operation doesn't inadvertently hurt the um, surface water users that are on the same stream. Um, But we do have to respect the NRD rules, also Natural Resources District rules. And so one thing we did recently was to tweak our form and we put a signature line for the Natural Resources District because at some point the NRD would be getting involved in that process and we found that it would be better to get them involved immediately so that the project proponent will know whether or not what they want to do is in accordance with the NRD rules or not. And so that's going to expedite the process. And of course, people are, this is um, uh, an idea that comes up during a drought where they're having a field that there's stress on the crop. They are wanting to get these processed fast. So we felt that would speed up the process. Yeah, that's awesome. I love that you um, have thought about starting that communication early. I feel like that's something that people don't necessarily think about. I think, um, 
yesterday when you were talking, you said panic, not plan. So starting that <laughs> communication early definitely helps mitigate the panic aspect of it. Right. That's awesome. Can you we, talk about the map transfer process? <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, so map transfers um, are a process that irrigation districts can engage in, and it's uh, for large generally larger uh, projects that have um, vast swaths of land. And it's a way that they can prepare for the future and they can make an application to the department and it involves the uh, district and department teams going out and engaging with every landowner that's uh, along an irrigation canal that's um, owned by an irrigation district. And if all of the landowners are um, willing to engage in this process, they'll sign a form that basically allows the department to work with the irrigation district. And we can develop a map of the land that's currently being irrigated from that canal. It's land essentially that's been irrigated within the last 10 years prior to the application. And then once um, we get through that process, get all the signatures in place, get the map uh, in place and we approve and we list out the lands and we approve the map, then from that point forward, the district actually is able to affect their own internal transfers. So they can move quickly. For instance, if there's, uh, the, and there is an ongoing conversion of irrigation systems, delivery systems from uh, more uh, furrow and gated pipe type delivery systems to center pivot and other kinds of automated sprinkler systems, then the district can move quickly with the farmers and reconfigure their irrigation fields. And then the next year, they just the district has to notify the department what they've done. So that, in theory at least, would enable the irrigation districts to move quickly in droughty, droughty situations to uh, improve the delivery system. Systems. We also work with individual farmers that have their own private water rights, and they're the most common theme we see with reconfiguring water rights is they're employing or have purchased uh, center pivot irrigation systems, and so the footprint on the ground is going to be a little bit different than their originally configured and approved water rights. So we have a mapping team and uh, some program specialists that work with the farmers to reconfigure their fields. And it improves the irrigation efficiency. In other words, they can be more efficient with the water that they do divert out of the streams. And it also reduces the amount of labor involved. And so they can more effectively irrigate and it's more important during droughts than any other time. So it's not necessarily like a direct drought process that we go through, but it definitely pays off during droughts. And um, we do tend to see fairly a good amount of activity with folks wanting to do this kind of reconfiguration. We've had a lot of calls from farmers lately that they've, they're they uh, purchasing uh, systems and they want to know what it takes to get their water rights reconfigured. Yeah, that's awesome. Definitely want more efficient irrigation systems. I mean, I'm sure that farmers would want it to save them some money on water and then if we can conserve it in any way. It's definitely important in a drought. Right. So kind of speaking on the terms of that, I know we talked yesterday a little bit about construction permits and how you and your team help advise about maybe not doing certain things during irrigation season when water demand is high. Can you talk a little bit more about that? So um, depending on the kind of project, many times, for instance, uh, pipeline projects, and there's a lot of uh, pipelines um, that go through Nebraska carrying various kinds of petroleum and other chemicals. Sometimes those pipelines, either new construction or repairs need to be made. And so the there's usually some kind of a need for water when you're doing a construction project. And so we'll talk to the project proponents and find out what kind of uh, construction they need to do, what the possible water sources are going to be. Basically breaks down to either a groundwater source or are there groundwater wells available that can be repurposed or is there a surface water source. Quite often the most convenient thing to do is find a local flowing creek and uh, pump water out for dust control or for um, mixing concrete or boring if you're going to be uh, some of the pipelines are actually bored under underneath roads and actually even underneath streams, so they need water for those processes. And we'll talk to them about their construction scheduling, and we recommend that if they're going to go with a surface water source, that if at all possible, they schedule it outside of the May through September irrigation season, because we have to talk to them about the uh, possibility of water administration and 
So these are temporary permits. They're going to be the most junior permit on the system. And so if there's a shortage of water, and for instance, an irrigator calls and they're out of water, the most senior water rights have the right to divert the last bit of the stream flow that's available. So of course, the most junior person, the construction permit's going to be off, and that could be very inconvenient in the middle of a construction cycle. So fairly often, the uh, folks that are doing these projects are able to uh, schedule their water use for just before or just after the irrigation season and then avoid potential delays. That's pretty nice. I mean, you're thinking about conserving water, but then also about the construction project permit itself, too. Like, if there's no water to make the concrete, then I'm sure that they're going to get a delay. So it's dual purposes of having that good communication. Right. And one thing that also has happened when we're having these discussions, if their um, project really needs to be done, part of it, and the water needs need to be uh, addressed during the irrigation season, we do talk to them sometimes about repurposing water wells. And we actually have one of our, um, that would be in commercial or industrial use. And we do have a, a um, groundwater transfer authority. Uh, but there is an exception that we point out to these folks in that if they lease a well and they they lease the land upon which they have the construction project, which is obviously a, a requirement anyway. They can actually file a notice with us, and if they're going to withdraw less than 150 acre feet a year, they can actually, it's an expedited process where they can quickly get access. They publish notice in the paper so that anybody that feels like they may be negatively impacted has a chance to you know, comment and address the potential problems, but it's a way to quickly get uh, water that's an alternative to this uh, surface water stream source. So that's worked out quite well in a number of situations. I feel like that's uh, one of your tips and tricks when somebody calls you, you're like, hey, by the way. <laughs> right. Yep. I mean, it, the, it was uh, an exception to the transfer statutes that was specifically put in for this sort of, you know, small amount of use. And typically, um, these projects are using a lot less than 150 acre feet. It's just a little bit of water in a, in a small project area. That makes sense. So it sounds like you deal with a lot of different rules and regulations and restrictions all over the state. Is there is that like pretty daunting, pretty scary? Or like the more you work with it, the better it gets? Do you have like a, a handout book or how does that work? Like I, I just feel yeah. like you know so much on this. We have a lot of online resources on our website that help folks that may want to apply for a different kind of water use, whether it be groundwater source or surface water source. But the experience really does help. And uh, when I first came over to the Permits and Registrations Division, it was um, pretty challenging at first because all the questions that came in, there was always a first time, like, oh, I've never had that situation come up before. Yeah, I'm sure and, there are a lot of first times. <laughs> right. So we have um, we have a couple of rule books that are geared towards helping folks that need some kind of service from us understand what the requirements are. So for groundwater, we call it the Nebraska Administrative Code, Title 456. And for surface water, it's Title 457. Those are on our website. Plus, so our program specialists, you know, have seen all kinds of water use. And so we've had a lot of different questions, but it still is always um, pretty intriguing. On a fairly regular basis, I'll get a new question or a new twist to a project or a water use that I I've never heard that question before. That keeps you on your toes. Yeah. So we, we go to the legislature's website fairly often and look up the actual base statutes and try and figure out how to help, you know, advise a person as, as to a new kind of a project or a different kind of water use that we hadn't dealt with before. So there's the, I'd say the legislature's um, website, chapter 46, if you want to go there and search laws. You'll find a lot of amazing stuff there. <laughs> if you're ever just um, hanging out on a Saturday yeah. evening, not sure what to do, just right. go to the website. <laughs> yep. So I want to ask you a question. If you have any parting thoughts or comments or suggestions to anybody just kind of tuning in, what would you give them? Any kind of advice, tips, tricks? We'll definitely put um, links on this podcast and on any kind of outreach material of where to go if they're looking for service water, groundwater permits. But do you have any anything that you want to just the last minute throw back? I just say that if anybody's considering a new project or altering an existing project, for instance, um, a surface getting a new surface water right, we call those appropriations, but it's easier to say surface water right, or, you know, altering an existing one, you know, they can 
certainly welcome to you know study the rules and and the statutes but really just give us a call just call our main uh, phone line and ask for a program specialist in the permitting area and we'll We'll be glad to talk to you and probably have some questions and try and advise you as best we can. So really, I mean, in a nutshell, what we do is just customer service. And we try and help facilitate folks. There are laws that um, are pretty prescriptive in some cases about how you go about using water. I mean, it's always good to keep in mind that the waters of the state, surface water and groundwater, are dedicated to the citizens. But we have a process where people can make beneficial use. And it's a, it's a fairly easy process. But the simplest way to embark on that is just to, as soon as somebody thinks of an idea that they want to do with a, a water project, just give us a call and we can advise them as far as what they do and maybe what they don't need to do. Awesome. And my last question that I have for you is, if you could eat any food... For the rest of your life, and that's the only thing you could eat, what would it be? Chocolate fudge. What? (laughs) Chocolate fudge? (laughs) There's no nutritional value in that. No, but I'm assuming that I could uh, get away with that (laughs) in your hypothetical world. Okay, that's true. I did not state the caveats of that, but okay, good to know. (laughs) If it needs to be nutritious, uh, let's see, what would I choose? I would probably choose black beans. I could probably live for a while on that and water. <laughs> yeah, you could do like tacos, a black bean burger. Yep. Like brew-fied black beans. I don't, that's pretty good. Yeah. Yep. All right. As far as health goes, I'd go with black <laughs> beans. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks so much, Mike, for taking the time to talk to us. Um, and we'll definitely put up the links. And if anybody has any questions, feel free to get a hold of Mike or call our main office. And thanks so much. Thank you. All right. Next, we have Jeremy with us. Jeremy, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your role here at the Department of Natural Resources? Yeah, thanks, Alexa, for having me here. Um, So my name is Jeremy Gailey. I'm a division manager for for Water Administration. This is my 22nd year with the department now. Um, I started out in the Lincoln Field Office under under Keith Paulson, did that for about 10 years, and then we also was the first manager of our data collection system that later became the the water administration division. So I grew up on a farm in Seward, Nebraska, uh, had uh, surface water irrigation, groundwater irrigation. So pretty familiar with uh, the task at hand when it does come to the water administration season. Awesome. Well, speaking of water administration, um, this podcast is all about the Department of Natural Resources, planning mitigation efforts against Nebraska drought. Mm-hmm. Can you tell us what your department or your division within the department does to help with that? Sure. So uh, one of the big things that we do that's not necessarily so related to drought is uh, uh, dam safety inspections. Uh, so I guess uh, by inspecting the dams, we can make sure that they're safe and able to hold waters for the period of time when there, when there are droughts. Another one of the big tasks that we do within our division is our stream gauging program. So the stream gauging program is important uh, to know how much water is in the rivers in relation to how much water is needed. So we have about 250 sites, uh, about 120 of them are rivers, uh, about another 130 by the math would be uh, uh, canals where we uh, check and monitor diversions and water availability. And uh, again, those things are all really important to know how much water there is to parse around. But probably the most important thing that we do in terms of drought planning it relates back to to the prior appropriation system. So the first in time, first in right theory of water rights. So uh, when there's not enough water to go around, we administer water based on those who have the oldest right are are the ones to be guaranteed that water over appropriation that would be younger. Uh, so oftentimes uh, this is this is something that usually stirs up a bunch of controversy between all the different irrigators, those who don't have the the oldest water rights, and they always ask, well, who set that up? And like, well, I, I think the the state of Nebraska had it right when they were first admitted into the union. So the prior appropriation doctrine was adopted all the way back in the state constitution back in in 1875. So we had water planning on our minds even back then. And the idea behind that is uh, we wanted to develop Nebraska uh, as as best as we can for agriculture and and economics. And uh, it gives those people with the oldest water right some level of assurity that that they will have water when when it is scarce. And no one would, would button line in front of them on the river and take it uh, ahead of them. Yeah, I've often thought that Nebraska has been pretty progressive in our water planning efforts. Um, I think we're pretty advanced when it comes to other states. There's always things that we can improve on. But the task of telling somebody that they might not have water or that they don't, how does that go over? Is That that seems kind of daunting. My yeah. 
be perceived as the bad guy. <laughs> well, for sure we are, yeah. Uh, and that, that is the, the hardest thing that we have to do. And, and, and again, for, from where I grew up and the perspective that I had coming from a farm and having, having water rights really helped me to, to have a relationship and some, some knowledge about how the process worked and an ability to, to develop a rapport with the other folks that I'm talking to uh, when we're out there to close junior appropriations out. Uh, it, it is difficult and uh, you, you, you feel terrible for, for folks if there's an extended period of time where these guys are going to be closed that it's going to affect their their bottom line and their livelihoods. So we, we try to be as, as delicate as, as possible relating that. Uh, but, but at the end of the day, I think most of those folks outside of the newest water rights holders have an understanding of this is the way the system works. And uh, we, we understand that we've had water for, for nine or ten good years before before the drought came, and this is the year where we accepted the risk of, of the prior appropriation system, and this is our turn to be off. So having having that background and uh, having done it now for 22 years helps us relate to, to those folks when we do a, go out and do those closures. Yeah, so you, you probably have a pretty good relationship with the different landowners just because you guys have been doing this for so long. You yeah. know, you have that basic background knowledge, so it's maybe not as terrible. Right. And some places are, are, are more prone to water administration than others. If you look at Nebraska, how the, the precipitation works out from east to west, uh, 16 inches to 33 in the, in the eastern Nebraska. We'll experience a lot more levels of water administration out in western Nebraska. And uh, there are places where, where water rights are just more densely populated that, that has more water administration. We see those guys more often, so we have a, an opportunity to develop uh, uh, better relationships and and uh, work with those guys before the drought hits to let them know that conditions are, are looking kind of grim. If you have some irrigation that you wanted to do, uh, we, we might have a water administration here in a couple of weeks. You might be without water. So we try to encourage those guys to, to irrigate their crops when they when they are allowed to, to, to hopefully make it through that, uh, that period where they can't irrigate. So speaking of western Nebraska, um, most people probably don't know that we had field offices across the state. Yep. Can you talk a little bit more about the field office? Sure, sure. So uh, Water Administration Division uh, encompasses about 30 people in total. So our our main office, of course, is here in Lincoln, but we have field offices across the state, too. We have a we have a field office actually located within our main office that covers southeast Nebraska, but we have five total field offices across the state. So we have another one in Norfolk that covers the, the Elkhorn River Basin. Uh, we have one in Ord, which uh, covers the Loop and the Lower Elkhorn, or I'm sorry, the Lower Nibera. Uh We have uh, actually the, the oldest office. It was the original office for all the Department of Natural Resources, which was the Department of Water Resources, is out in Bridgeport, Nebraska. That, that building is over 100 years old and was the originally housed our full agency. We have about 10 people out in, in Bridgeport. And then we have another field office in Cambridge, which is uh, uh, overseeing the the water administration and, and other field office needs in, in the Republican River Basin. Awesome. So I'm assuming that the different field offices probably all do the same thing, but maybe in a different way according to the rules, regulations, yeah. or if there's compact decrees. So that sounds pretty challenging of having everybody, I guess, know that um, amount of knowledge in the yeah. different regions. How does that go? No, so you're, you're absolutely right. It's, it's, as much as it's same, uh, the same across the state, there's so many things that are, that are different locally too. So yeah, you mentioned the, the compacts. So we've got the, the Blue River Compact, which is overseen by our Lincoln Field Office, the Republican River Compact, of course, and our, and our Cambridge Field Office. And we have compacts and decrees, uh, South Platte River Compact and the North Platte Decree also. Niagara Compact, but each each of those are different in their own right, and and it's up to those field offices as well as our staff here that are that are specialized in each of those locations to to have a full grasp and understanding of all that those compacts are are required of us to do. Another difference between the sides of the states or the different field offices is uh, Cambridge, Ord, and in our Bridgeport field office all deal with uh, with canals, so sort of surface water diversions off of big canals right off the river, whereas you get to, to eastern Nebraska, it's mostly individual pumps out of a, out of a stream with a, with a suction pipe. So all kinds of different administration 
the, the canals have less water rights overall, but irrigate more acres. But on the eastern side of the state, with those irrigate individual pumps, we have probably two or three times as many overall water rights as, as they do out west. So it's, it's different challenges for different locations, for sure. Well, I guess I'm just wondering if somebody's listening to this podcast and maybe still has a basic understanding of water administration, what's a main takeaway that you would want them to know about, you know, you and your team? Like, yeah. what what's something that they can learn from this? What we do for water water administration is all based on the prior appropriation system. So it's probably something that might be foreign to most folks that, that aren't uh, involved with agriculture, specifically surface water irrigation. But the uh, the first in time, first in right uh, prior appropriation system is probably the, the biggest takeaway I want folks to have. And it's uh, we're probably the easternmost state in, in the United States that, that operates that on, on that principle, but all Western states operate on that first in time, first in right prior appropriation system. Well, um, I told you I was going to ask you this, so all I right. feel like you had some cheat time, but if you could have one kind of food or one certain food for the rest of your life, what would you have? Now, this one's, this one's easy for me. I, I, I think about this quite often <laughs> because I, I don't want to ever be without food, but it's, it's definitely got to be pizza. There's uh, so many different directions that, that you can go with that, uh, toppings, sauces, crusts. Fruit pizza, fruit, breakfast pizza. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. that's a, that's so, a good answer. <laughs> if that fits the bill, that's what I'm going with. <laughs> yes, yeah. that does. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Jeremy, so much for talking with us. Um, And if anybody has any questions, we'll definitely post links. um, And you can go ahead and call the department or you can call and get a hold of Jeremy or any of the field offices as well. So thanks so much for having us. Yep. Thanks, Alexa. Hi, everyone. We have Jamie here. Hi, Jamie. Hi, I'm Jamie Ranke with the floodplain management section. I'm the new team leader. So that's me. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, you want to tell us a little bit about like what you do just in general. Um, we're going to get into drought a little bit today and what you guys have to do with that. But um, just kind of give us a rundown of like what you do specifically for your division or your section. Sure. So floodplain management is responsible for mapping floodplains throughout the state. We do that using FEMA funds right now, but if FEMA funds were to go away, we would still, by state statute, have to do that. So we would still have a team no matter what. Um, We also are the state NFIP coordinating office, which means that we are working with communities that participate in the National Flood Insurance Program to make sure that they are meeting the intent of the program and providing technical assistance and training. Um, We're out in the communities a lot and building partnerships with floodplain administrators and other local officials all the time. Awesome. Well, thank you for all that you do. Um, Alexa, do you want to get into drought and kind of what you talked about when I wasn't here? (laughs) (laughs) Sure. So um, this podcast is focused on DNR's efforts of planning and mitigation of drought. And you don't necessarily think about drought and flooding being the same, but they're still natural disasters. And so we need to plan for it, right? So what does your program do to help kind of like plan against those natural disasters or natural emergencies that happen? Or assist in other ways to different divisions, like anything that you guys do that could relate to that? Yeah. So obviously when you're thinking of (laughs) drought, you're not thinking of flooding, which is our focus, but there is a tie and drought can cause flooding to be more severe. Um, The other thing that we see a lot of is communities tend to have short memories. All of us tend to have short memories when it comes to flooding. So when we're in drought periods, uh, our message is a little bit lost in the shuffle of drought planning and surviving drought. So it's even more important for us to be working with communities to make sure that they are ready during blue sky times, as Mm -hmm. we call it. For the next flood, because we have seen that cycle change very rapidly. I mean, we had some major droughts in Nebraska in the early 2000s that quickly transferred to major flooding in 2011 Mm -hmm. along the Missouri River. And we have seen that similar trend time and time again. So we don't necessarily do anything specific to drought because we are floodplain management. But one of the things that we do a lot of is coordinating with NEMA, the Nebraska Emergency management agency for hazard mitigation planning. And hazard mitigation planning is something that all of the local communities are working on. While we only review the flood section, there is a drought component to all of those plans and it has to be addressed. So um, as we're meeting with NEMA and meeting with communities, that is a topic that comes up. That's awesome. 
That was a really great response. Yeah, that was. <laughs> um, so you said that you work with different communities across the state. What does that look like? Is that like every um, year you're like rotating different areas? That way you're encompassing all of them? Do you have like local uh, meetings that are just held like once a year? I guess how does that work? That seems like it's pretty daunting. Yes, it can be. And that's a really good question. There are two different ways that the team works with communities. So when we are actively mapping at a Huck 8 watershed level, we have specific meetings that have to occur with communities to make sure that they're informed on what the mapping process looks like and that they know that they're getting new maps and are informed and engaged in that process. A mapping project can take up to five years, in some cases longer than that. So we need to make sure that communities aren't forgetting that this is happening because it does impact them Mm -hmm. once new maps go effective through FEMA's program. The other side of our team, the NFIP coordinating side of the team, they are boots on the ground out with communities all the time. That looks a little bit different since the pandemic. Uh, We Mm -hmm. do more virtual trainings than we used to. But that's been a really good thing because we can do outreach with more communities because oftentimes our floodplain administrators are holding multiple titles within a community and can't travel to a one hour or half a day class Mm -hmm. because they can't leave their office. So offering virtual trainings has been really helpful in that regard. But we are doing all sorts of training related to floodplain management topics. In fact, tomorrow there's a four-hour basic floodplain management training that the CAP team is hosting virtually. And um, we also are doing what they call FEMA audits. FEMA okay. is transitioning to calling them audits. They're actually um, what we call community assistance contacts or community assistance visits. And that's where we go into a community and have, if it's a community assistance contact, just kind of a quick discussion with them about floodplain management and do a quick look at how they're managing floodplain development in their community and making sure that they're following the rules so that they are able to stay active within the program. Because what the program offers for communities is availability for federally backed flood insurance for communities that participate. So anyone that has a home that has a federally backed mortgage can pick up flood insurance. And if there's a flood event in their town, then they, of course, are better able to uh, recover afterwards. I feel like the virtual meetings is probably one of the only good things that came out of COVID. Yeah. (laughs) Um, you know, you said that you had something coming up tomorrow, but, um, you know, this is going to come out sometime um, late December, the last workday of December. So are you aware of any uh, events coming up in January that you could plug? Or So Floodplain Management does a one-hour lunch and learn type virtual training every month, and those topics are listed on our website. They're in our quarterly newsletter, which our newsletter will go out in January. So you can check there. Um, But also, you can reach out to anyone on the team, and we have a whole list of trainings that are coming up. If anyone has a topic that they'd like covered, we're always interested in adding to the content that we're getting to people because we want to make sure that the training is helpful. Mm -hmm. And if there are floodplain administrators that are struggling with a certain part of their job, our job is to help them Mm -hmm. to provide that assistance. And our training budget can really accommodate anything that a floodplain administrator needs. That's That's, awesome. Yeah, that's so good to hear that those resources can be allocated. Yeah, and, you know, if anyone's really interested in doing that, just look at our social media on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I think mostly just Facebook and Twitter right now. Um, But, yeah, those those links to those different events are usually out there. So just look that up. Um, So something that we've been asking all the other divisions is that – you know, somebody listening to this podcast, maybe not necessarily related to drought, but what do you want people to know about your work, your section, that what you guys do? Just like one key takeaway. Uh, Floodplain does a lot. And I think that uh, a lot of people don't understand what it is we do or don't know what it is that we do. But one great thing our team does in the technical assistance realm or the mapping world is we provide all of these services using federal funds or state funds And there's no cost share for the communities. So the training is free. The mapping is free, which that's huge because mapping, if you're hiring a consulting firm, is going to be very expensive for a community. (laughs) 
So it's a really great thing that we can provide to communities, even though communities aren't always wanting to have new maps because it does have an impact on the populations there. It's really important for people to understand their flood risk and understand Mm -hmm. what's going to happen or what could potentially happen in uh, a flood event. You know, they might need to think about evacuation routes. They might need to think about if their fire station gets cut off and isn't Mm -hmm. able to go and help people. So... Uh, we just have a lot of services that we can provide to people, and I and we have the best team, the yeah. best team. Everybody is so engaged in the work, and we love what we're doing. We love getting out and talking to communities, and um, Nebraska is also really unique in the mapping world because we are one of the only cooperating technical partners through FEMA that does the work solely in-house. Wow. Um, <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah, everyone else <laughs> contracts out with some of the national contractors through FEMA's work, but we are, I think, one of two that do the work in house. So you guys do everything. Shout out to Floodplane in Nebraska. Shout out. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it's in, it's interesting to think about because you know having these classes and trainings available to, to the community is like really important. I mean, Ali and I are thinking about buying a house, and when I was talking to Shuhai the other day, and he was like, "You know, make sure make sure you know where you're buying your house." And I'm like, yeah. I didn't even. That was not in my mind, but thank you, hi. The yeah. city yeah. is getting ready to do new floodplain maps, so make <laughs> yeah. sure you're checking in with floodplains so we can keep you informed. Right, right. <laughs> but yeah, um, I, I don't have any other questions. I so. have one last question. Oh. Um, so if you could have any kind of food for the rest of your life and not eat anything else, <laughs> what would you eat? You can say like a certain food or a category. Yeah. Mm, that's a tough one. I might go with pizza. <gasps> nice. Yeah, yeah, shout out sweet. to pizza. Yeah, it's like, yeah. what, three three in how many? Seven so yeah. far? Yeah. That's awesome. But yeah, um, that was a good answer. That was also my answer. Pizza's dynamic. The sauce, you can change the crust. Like, exactly. So many ways you can go with that. Dessert pizza, <laughs> breakfast pizza. Yeah. Right. Breakfast, well, lunch, and dinner pizza. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Jamie, for taking the time and talking to us. Um, and it, we will definitely post any links when we uh, send out the mm-hmm. podcast. So if anybody has any questions, feel free to reach out. Um, and then definitely look on our social media. Floodplain is pretty relevant, our social media as well. So thank yeah, you so much. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thanks. Today we have our special guest, Tim, from Dam Safety. Tim, you want to talk about who you are, what you do for the agency real quick? Sure. So I'm Tim Gokey. I'm the chief engineer for our, our Dam Safety program at the Department of Natural Resources. And yeah, I've been in the job for about eight years, been with the department for about 15 years. So this podcast is focused on uh, the Department of Natural Resources planning mitigation efforts against drought. And I know people probably don't associate dam safety with drought, but can you elaborate on any kind of work that you do that might be relevant to droughts? Sure. So yeah, I mean, the, the purpose of our program is more about public safety. So it's it's to reduce risk to life and property uh, downstream of dams in Nebraska. To do this, we focus really on, on three areas, primarily construction oversight, So anytime there's going to be construction on a dam in the state, plans are submitted and we review those plans to make sure they're consistent with current standards. We do routine inspections of nearly 3,000 dams across the state. Oh my gosh, that's a ton. That is a lot. (laughs) Yeah, it's it's not uncommon that I tell people what I do and they say, we have dams in Nebraska? (laughs) Yeah, we do. (laughs) We have a lot. But uh, so, yeah, we do routine inspections. If we find any problems, we alert the dam owners and then the dam owners uh, can take action to, re- to fix any problems that there are. Third area is emergency response. We have 153 dams in the state that if they were to fail, there's a high probability that there would be loss of life. So those dam owners are required to have an emergency action plan. So we review those plans to make sure they're adequate and that they're up to date. But when it comes to drought, it really does not have a big effect on what we do. During our inspections, uh, we have to inspect the spillways. Some of those spillways are concrete spillways that go over top of the dam. But many of them are pipes or conduits that go through the dams. And some of these, uh, depending on where the dams are located, they flow year round. They always have water flowing in them. 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. So it makes inspections of those pipes difficult. But in times of drought, a lot of them will dry up. The water flow will stop. So it allows us to get out there and do a detailed inspection of those. So that's something we really focus on when things are dry. When you can get it to it, you, you make sure that you get 
to it. Yeah. Right, you know, right. So, you know, it's been, you know, this year it's been a dry year, so we've done a lot of spillway inspections. So, yeah, I guess that's uh, that's primarily kind of how drought affects us. You know, like I said, primary purpose is protect life, public safety, but a primary benefit of dams, of course, is providing water for irrigation, mm-hmm. especially in the West. Which uh, is important in times of a drought. Exactly. exactly yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, tens of thousands of acres in the West that, uh, you know, all across the state, but especially in the West where we have tens of thousands of acres that the dams provide water during times of drought. So, how do you know... If there's a drought and that you can access a spillway, do you work with an RDs or our field offices across the state? Do you have like bureau records? Who's checking those levels so you know that like oh it's it's dry it's there I can go. <laughs> yeah, so primarily it's you know it's the drought monitor. You know we, we get we get that every week when it's sent out to all the staff. That, you know, it's a, a thing that everybody's interested in, so we have an idea. Uh, also, our dam owners. So if if we have spillways that flow all the time, we tell our dam owners that hey, let us know if this dries up. We want to. Uh, so we that's the primary ways. But, well, yeah, yeah I think that's primarily the way. Yeah. And our field offices too. You yeah. know, they keep us all informed about what the streams are doing in their updates and so forth. So, so we have a pretty good idea what's going on. So would you say you have a good um, relationship with the dam owners because they also value their safety of the dams? Like they don't want to be liable for anything. So you have this good rapport connection with them? Exactly. I mean, that's the way we look at it is you know, we want to build those relationships and we want to see our program. We want them to see us as, as a asset that, mm-hmm. that we're, resource. we're on the same team. They have a dam for a reason. They want to protect those benefits and, and, and they, and they also understand the, the risk if the dam were to fail. If they don't, we're going to educate them on the risk. Right. Uh, but it, it, but it's an ever, it's both in our interest and the public's interest and in the dam owner's interest to have a, a well-maintained safe dam. Yeah. So, um, sorry, I'm just like spitballing questions. No, that so, is perfectly. <laughs> you go for it. <laughs> since there are so many dams across the state, do you just, you know, in the summer do a campaign across, you know, Nebraska? Or is there like certain regions and certain areas you want to try and hit or... How does that work logistics-wise? Yeah, so um, I don't want to get down in the weeds too much, but we do classify all the dams based on their risk. Primarily, it's the consequences if the dam were to fail. Um, The higher the consequences, the more often we inspect those dams. Earlier, I mentioned the high-hazard potential dams. Those dams that if they were to fail, there's a high probability of loss of life. Those are set up to, for an annual inspection, so we inspect those dams every year. On the opposite end of the scale, what we call minimal and low hazard dams. The minimal hazard dams, those are set up, we inspect every 10 years. So those are dams that if they were to fail, nobody other than the dam owner is probably going to know. I joke that a lot of those are very rural. You only see cows out there, and if mm-hmm. the dam fails, it might only be the cows. They're the only ones oh, that no. really know. <laughs> the poor cows. <laughs> but, so, you know, those aren't a big focus for us. But things can change. You know, we have dams that are in rural areas, and there's really nobody around. And if they fail, nobody knows. But sometimes we go out to those dams, and somebody's built a house a mile downstream. And now it could be it could go from minimal to high hazard mm-hmm. because somebody built a house downstream of the dam or built a new business downstream of the dam. Right. So yeah, they're all set up on a schedule. Every every winter, we go through and look once, which ones are due for inspection, and uh, we have our inspection roster. And then uh, usually it works out to about 700 dams a year, and then we divide that up among our staff. Everybody's given a list to, to get, get done. If anyone's interested in looking at those stats, we do post our metrics regarding um, those inspections to see where we're at in the year every month. So if you're interested, uh, that's on our website. I'll um, post a link with that. So I have a question on when you inspect the dams. To me, that seems like, I don't know, how do you how do you inspect that? Is there drones or? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, do you, what do you use to? Check? What do you look for? What do you use? How do you go about that? And, you know, I know that the field office sometimes help you guys out like yeah. are there differences are the procedures all pretty much the same yeah so we do have a lot of tools to help us with our inspections um you know i like to say our best tool is our our eyes and so it, it typically it's a visual inspection we're walking the entire length of the dam more than once usually mm-hmm. maybe two or three times back and forth you know upstream downstream crest uh that sort of thing really looking for anything that's out of the ordinary rodent uh, holes rodent <laughs> holes trees are also a, a common problem but but really looking for areas that are wet that shouldn't be wet okay um so you know all dams do have seepage they do seep typically we have drains uh, we have seepage control measures in place but if there's water in a place that it shouldn't be, that's what we're looking for. Uh, sometimes it's obvious, but otherwise it can be pretty subtle. And, and that's, I guess, that kind of gets to another a drought issue, right? If, if things are really dry and then we see an area where the grass is green, where it's like, what's brown everywhere else, <laughs> uh, 
I mean, that's an indication, yeah, that we've got, we may have water somewhere where it shouldn't be. You know, that could lead us to do a more detailed, in-depth look at that area to see what's going on. So anyway, other tools that we use, we do have a drone and, and uh, you know, I didn't know how valuable that would be, but uh, it does give us a new perspective and, it, and we can cover a lot of ground in a hurry. You know, some areas can be naturally wet, wetlands downstream of dams that are really uh, difficult or impossible really to, to get through. You know, you're walking through cattails that are up above your head. Uh, we can put the drone up and fly over those areas and see a lot of areas that we haven't been able to see in the past. Um, so it's been a really valuable tool for us. Uh, we also have uh, a pipe camera. It's a remote operated uh, system. Um, so some of the conduits are too small for us to get into. So we can put that camera up, up those uh, conduits and do internal inspections using that as well. So it's a valuable tool for us as well. Awesome. Sounds like you have a wide variety of tools and technologies that you use to help accomplish your mission. Yeah, we do. I guess we could go into more detail about some other things, but you know, I don't we'll know. We'll invite you back. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't, again, not getting too much into the weeds or too technical. Right. But um, one last question kind of regarding drought. So somebody listening to this podcast, what's the main takeaway that you want them to know about your work and your section? It may or may not be related to drought, but or the TED Talk point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I guess uh, I'll keep it focused on drought. I, 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 would, I probably close with, you know, the same things we do to protect life and property uh, downstream of dams. Also also benefits uh, the state in times of drought because those same things we do to make sure the dams are safe and stay there. Uh, they also make sure the dams are there storing water when it's needed for irrigation. Oh, perfect. And we have one final question for you. Okay, if you had to have one food for the rest of your life, what would that food be? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> it can know. be like I'm, a single thing or like a vert like a, a it category. seems so final like if i say this and it's yeah and we're think, gonna judge you tomorrow <laughs> oh, that's it like it's gonna happen right so what if i get it wrong we'll <laughs> choose something with a year no from now be like, why did i say that <laughs> So the thing that comes to mind would be, you know, I, I've always loved pizza. So I, there you I, go. I okay. have it. It's like <laughs> six for seven or six, six for eight. Or seven. Yeah. You, know, you always say it includes all five food groups, right? So, yeah, it does. So how, how could it be? Dessert, breakfast, lunch. People eat dinner. for breakfast. Yeah. So. Yeah. I had pizza last night. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you for playing that game. That was super fun. Thank you for <laughs> thank you for answering uh, some of our questions today. Um, it's really insightful, and we'll be back in the future with uh, more questions for you. So, yeah, thank you. thank you so much. Sounds good. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Okay, last but not least, we have Tom and Jesse speaking with us. Um, can you two give everyone a quick introduction of yourselves and your title here at DNR? Hey everybody, this is Tom Riley. I'm the director at DNR. This is Jesse Bradley. I'm deputy director here at the Department of Natural Resources. All right. And so we've heard from all the different divisions here at the Department of Natural Resources about our agency efforts of planning and mitigation against the drought in Nebraska. Can you two give everyone kind of a wrap up like cherry on top of the cake? Well, uh, I always tell people that you need to be planning for drought or floods all the time. Nobody cares about flooding unless it's flooding. Nobody cares about whether it's dry and unless there's a drought. But we have to plan all the time for both of those events. And the department's been working hard and integrating with our partners to do this type of resilient drought planning for some time. So it comes at a great time in that it is dry now. But the work never ends. Um, and we'll keep pushing forward to find ways to have resiliency and drought, ways to work through it. Because one thing we know about the hydrologic cycle, it, It'll swing the other way at some point in time. We just need to get through this time now. You know, I think that's a big part of what we do, obviously, is try to, you know, be prepared, plan for, and uh, help folks be uh, ready to accept these kind of situations as best we can to get through them, as Tom said. Uh, we got a lot of efforts going on. I think there's, you know, a lot of uh, exciting information we're putting together uh, for people to be able to have access to that maybe they haven't had uh, historically. So, you know, we'll keep pushing on that front. We, we focus a lot on communication and making sure people, you know, know what's coming, kind of be able to plan for and expect those uh, those situations that are sometimes difficult, but uh, we try to make the, the best of that, make sure people are aware. So, uh, Alexa, we really want to have our partners down to the producer level, have information to make the best decisions they can, going in the face of drought and working through these times where there might be a shortage of water supply. But Around the corner, we'll have uh, other opportunities and to make sure that we have a way to be resilient and bounce back. We've made some great investments that 
I think uh, Assistant Director Bradley could could brush up on for us. Yeah, I mean, we've got a, a lot of money we've invested over the last decade and a half or so uh, from the Water Resources Cash Fund. You know, that, that investment is aimed at making basins more resilient to drought. Uh, those are activities like taking excess flows out of the river, recharging aquifers so that water can return at times like this and we can have a better situation. Also, of course, we had a pretty historical set of investments in water last legislative session and we're working on implementing those now. And those will pay dividends in the future as well. Uh, projects like the Perkins County Canal, investments we're making with the city of Lincoln through uh, ARPA funding to help them with their second source, uh, investments in surface water irrigation infrastructure. All those those activities are going to be uh, important as we look forward to future droughts and making sure that we have our water supply secured. Yeah, the, those those type of investments really pay dividends out in the future, the future that we always don't know what it's going to be. Here in Nebraska, we know it's uh, cold today and maybe hot tomorrow, snowy today and maybe sunny tomorrow. And although it's dry, we might turn the corner and get a lot of precipitation. So those kind of projects that allow us to smooth out the uh, hydrology the best we can will be a, a really important part of Nebraska's future for uh, all of our people. For more information, you know, check our website, give a call to the department, and we'll, we can answer those questions for you. Um, so I did ask everybody so far um, that we have talked to a random question, so I'm going to ask you two. Um, if you could only have one kind of food for the rest of your life, what would it be? Uh, blueberries. What? Just Blueberries. Well, you said just one food. I could expand. Uh, maybe a, a blueberry pie. See, I'm going to cheat. I'm, I'm going to say nachos because, you know, you can put, like, whatever you want on nachos. Yeah. <laughs> Would you put blueberries on nachos? Maybe. Maybe a breakfast nacho or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah you could you do could a dessert a nacho, food. like blueberries, strawberries, and you just have blueberries. Well, you know, it's, <laughs> the, it's the mental food. Um, throw a few walnuts in there, and that's probably all you need. <laughs> okay. Plus water. <laughs> thanks so much for taking time out of your day tom and jesse to be a part of our agency-wide podcast um, i think it's really interesting to hear about the different infrastructures for water projects that we have across the state and how the department is ever changing and that we really are here to serve the people of nebraska i think that maybe sometimes people get lost in the translation of our data and science but we really are here to help preserve water for today and for tomorrow and we're here to serve our community and it was a lot of fun putting this podcast together just so we can do exactly that and to make the information that we have and the resources that we have as transparent as possible so that way people know what we're up to what we do regarding drought and yeah it, it's just been a lot of fun doing this podcast it was a long time in in the making and it took a lot of effort but it was fun to get everybody together and you know we're super grateful for our directors for participating it was awesome having them come and speak with us to help us get that message across and also to our division heads and everyone who took the time out of their days to work with us and put this together it was awesome yeah it was awesome to get to talk to the different sections and divisions about their work and especially during a really busy time with the holidays mm -hmm. and the weather conditions and everything so we appreciate everybody that took the time logistically to come talk to us we know it was somewhat of a hassle but i had a blast we did it, it was a lot of fun i learned a lot too yeah, I mean, yeah, it's it's really important that people know what we're up to and what we do regarding drought because, you know, especially in a time like this, it's a hot topic and people want to know. Thank you so much for tuning in, guys. Thank you for your interest in learning about drought planning and mitigation efforts in the state. And we'll talk to you in the next one. I think break time's over. Break time's over. It's lunchtime. Lunchtime <laughs> for Alexa, not me. <laughs>